I'm Bruce Worson, pastor of His Place Community Church. The following message came from a Sunday morning right here at His Place. What's the best thing that God hasn't given you? Now think about it, because there's actually a lot to choose from right there. Just think back to every single unanswered prayer that you've ever prayed and just take your pick. He seems to hold back a lot of stuff. But while we're ruminating on our answer, let's remind ourselves of an all-time favorite gift that God says he does give. Right here he says, come to me all you who are weary and burdened, which is all of us, by the way, and I will give you Rest. rest. Woo! Rest is the best. Now we're talking. Who doesn't love rest? Just imagine actually getting it, actually unwrapping a single week of real worry-free, put your feet up, rest this Christmas. Really think about it. Oh, wouldn't that be the best gift that you just ever got? Because we're all, all of us, every single one of us, we're all weary and we're all burdened and we're all just aching for all the rest that we can get. So that's why we love this little break that we get between holidays, right? That comes right after all the constant chaos of family and cooking, but right before all the consuming craziness of more family and then Christmas. This is a wonderful little opportunity because right here in this little moment, all we need is just that little peaceful pause to get a grip on some rest, right? Then what is the deal? Why did the guy who gives us rest say this? Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. What? I thought he wanted us to have rest. How does God give us rest without peace? And why exactly was he packing a sword? That makes me scared. Well, I hate to be the bearer of good news, but it is my job. But Jesus came here to start fights and light fires because he knows us better than we do. And here's the secret. Peace isn't the productive part of our path to rest. Doesn't do a lot. Nope. Just gets you more tired. And we know that because we had it back at the beginning and it didn't take. It was already all good back in the garden, and it was us who made the original fuss. And because we weren't content with God's peace and quiet back there, all in paradise, well, he kicked us out. He kicked us out to learn what restless work was all about. And after living this relentless life of labor, I don't know about you, but I am ready for the rest. Amen? Amen. Let's go then. I don't know how, but here we go. So that is exactly why though. This is exactly how his plan works. God does whatever it takes for us to learn our lesson. And when the easy way won't work, the hard way works wonders. It is unfortunate, but true. So even if it stings a little bit, blessed is the one whom God corrects. So do not despise the discipline of the Almighty. For he wounds, but he also binds up. He injures, make sure you hear that. He injures, but his hands also heal. And we understand that. We know that that's what he has to do, that it works that way. We know all about how well this approach to teaching works because oftentimes pain is part of the tough love tactic used to crack hard hearts. We have to do it for each other sometimes. Sometimes we need to be scared straight, right, to learn our lesson. Sometimes we need ultimatums in an intervention. And sometimes we just need a healthy dose of Christmas movies, amen? We do. Because Christmas movies, the whole genre is all about spreading peace and goodwill on earth. And yet, suspiciously, every single star of every single story seems to need some form of tough love to learn their lesson. Think about it. I mean, it took time-traveling ghosts to show how bleak Ebenezer Scrooge's broken life was before he would choose to build it back up. And it took a guardian angel erasing George Bailey from existence to teach him to love and appreciate the life that he was otherwise going to leave behind. And it took a lifetime of misery and mistakes to move the Grinch from misanthrope to Mr. Wonderful, right? All tough stuff. So, in our life's little movie, what you got playing right now, if all our relentless chaos is written 
authored by a loving God, we should all be wondering all the time, what is the purpose of my lack of peace? You know, what's going on in my story? What's the lesson that I'm supposed to be learning as the star of my story? It's a good Christmas question here for you. Because if a loving God is in fact in control, spoiler alert, he is, but if he's in control, he will only ever allow hurts and hardships that are absolutely necessary parts of our path to perfection. There's no pain for no reason. It's always got to be a part of that path to perfection. So this morning what I want to do is I want to take a look at three possible purposes that God is holding his peace in the middle of our mayhem, okay? And first, number one, with a bullet, when God withholds something that we want, but we can't quite reach it, he does this important thing. He demonstrates our deficiency. Very key component to what we're doing here. He demonstrates our deficiency. He shows us that there are some things that even our hardest work won't ever supply. You know, you just can't save yourself. Have you ever noticed the weird reason that God kicked us out of the garden so quickly back in the beginning? It's, it's really quite funny. Adam, Adam must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Oh, that would be terrible if he lived forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Isn't that interesting? We had to go or else, uh uh-oh, we'd stay alive, right? That's crazy. He didn't want us to stay alive. Why wouldn't he want that? And it's tough. These are tough truths from tough love, but it's because there's a lot, so much. I mean, this is what we're doing down here. There's a lot to learn from the fear of death. In fact, all adversity reveals our inadequacy. That's a big lesson for us to learn. Our unwinnable battle that we're all fighting right now, our unwinnable battle with death is a constant reminder of how much we all miss real life. And seeing what we're actually missing is huge because we gotta know what it is that we lack before we can want it back. And if you don't understand that principle, just ask a fish. Because, I don't know if you've heard this analogy, it's one of the greatest analogies ever. Fish don't know they're wet. You get that? Okay. Fish don't know they're wet. They can't know that they're wet. It's everywhere all the time. It's just, it's, it's, you say, well, it's, you know, it's the, the stuff that you're swimming in. They go, swimming? I don't understand. And you, well, you know, the water that's around, water, I don't understand that because it's everywhere. And when something is everywhere, you can't notice it anywhere. You need to see where it ends to define it. And yet, if you want to teach a fish, about water, the second that you take a fish out of water, well, they know all about it. (laughs) All of a sudden they understand, I need that stuff to breathe. I need water to move. I need water to live. They instantly know all that. And as they are drying and dying, all fish instantly know they want the water back, right? They don't need to understand everything about it, but they know enough to know that they want it back. And likewise, In the exact same way, when God kicked us out of his perfect presence, only then did we learn how he was the key to our life. Because hear this, he is the living water that we didn't know we needed until we started drying out and dying apart from it. And that's tough and a little bit scary, but guess what? Good news, it's all still part of the plan. This is all right on target because he tells us God marks humanity's appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Why is he, okay, what's he doing here? Well, God did this so that they would seek him. He did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him. Kind of like that tree of life we're reaching for, but he's trying to get us to reach out and actually find him, though he's not far from any one of us. For in him... We live and move, and in him we have our being, just like a fish in water. Some things are impossible to appreciate until we experience life without them. And in all of our restless reaching apart from God, it really gets us to ponder the life-giving peace 
of being in his presence. That's the water that we want. The second we're out of it, we're understanding that. That's why we're so restless down here. That's why it hurts so bad. And unfortunately, that's part of the plan because despite the discomfort, sometimes when we're not willing to learn it on our own, we have to learn lessons against our will. He tried to just give it to us. We wouldn't listen. So now we're doing things the hard way. Here comes the tough love. We have to learn lessons against our will and we call it discipline. Everybody knows it. Discipline, boo, nobody's a big fan of the feeling of discipline. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Ask any kid who's ever been punished. We know it. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace. There's that peace we're looking for. For those who have been trained by it, who've actually endured it and gone through it. Man, that is, it's one of those, it's a tough truth, but it's good to know. It just helps you to put, you know, purpose to your pain. But only the fear of death truly teaches the love of life, right? It's, you need that stark contrast. Only vulnerability truly teaches humility to have that experience. And only being saved truly teaches trust. Knowing that you're that fish out of water, which brings us to our second purpose in God, withholding his peace from us. When he does that, he illustrates his sufficiency. All right? His sufficiency, our deficiency. Once our deficiency has us reaching for that real life that we're trying to grab a hold of, we start actually seeing what it looks like. So every minute that we're dying for what we're missing, where's that water that I knew nothing about that I want it so bad right now? We're actually learning to love what leads to living. Fish love water. <laughs> they just do. The second that they don't have it, they realize, that's my favorite thing in the world. Taking us out of his presence, guess what? That's my favorite thing in the world. I see it now. And God gave us Jesus to provide the picture of perfection so that we would see he's the single source of the salvation that we're all seeking. The sun is the radiance of God's glory. And the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Get it? Sustains all things in him. You see, prior to Jesus, every single human who lived a life apart from God's presence died. Despite all of our best efforts to survive. That is the story of, you can look it up. Nobody's made it, you know? We all don't get out of here alive. So when Jesus became the first person to defeat death publicly, we saw sufficiency where all other humans had deficiency. And when someone actually achieves our objective, well, it only makes sense to try and follow in their footsteps, see what they did, how did they do it? Let's figure it out. Because here's the logic. If Christ has not been raised, right? If that didn't happen, then your faith is futile. Correct. Because that's what we're looking for, that answer. So if he didn't, then who cares? But here's the thing. Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. That's what the whole book's about. It did happen. And so because we have that example, we got to wonder what's the deal. The billion dollar question becomes, how did he do it? And we just read the answer, remember? Well, it was just by being the exact representation of God's being. That's, that's it. He just was the source. He was the perfection that sustains all things. That's him. That's who he is. He was the source of living water that all us flopping fish need to live. And he came to us to call us home. To make that way back to the water. To show us, us fish where to flop in the right direction. Which is why we're told you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. From what he did to show us there. For he himself is our peace. He is that life sustaining peace and presence as a bridge between certain death and living water. He's, he's the only thing from both sides. Because God sent Jesus from that place, from that, that water, that living water realm, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth, down here away from it, or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. 
putting a foot in each place there. So here's the big surprise, okay? This is, this is the twist, which is why I know I'm saying some sacrilegious sounding things. He doesn't like us to have peace or rest. Well, here's what it is. God doesn't give peace. He gives Jesus. And that is way better. It is way better. It's bigger than we hope for. It's like getting the fountain when you're just asking for a sip. He just says, it's not fire hose time. You know, you, I just, could I have a thimble full? And he's just, all you can handle forever and ever. That's what he gives us instead. And that's when we learn that real peace isn't the absence of adversity. It's the presence of Jesus. That's it. That's the thing. It's not like you just need to put out this fire. You need to put out all fires forever. It, when he's around, it just doesn't happen. He is. We're in the water. We're in the living water when we have him. And the more we come to know him, the more God teaches us, it's the relationship, not the rules that keep paradise perfect. It was never the rules. That's not what got us there is following the rules. It's just the relationship. It is us and that life-giving water together. Just like a fish needs to be in water to stay alive, we need to be in God's presence to stay alive. And that can only happen through a relationship with Jesus. Because he is that thing that we need. So no wonder there is always a very subtle stipulation to every gift that God wants to give. I don't know if you noticed it in the early scripture here. It said, um, Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and then I'll give you rest. Boom, there was the key. Come to me. God has got everything that we need. But he keeps it in his son's hands. And by keeping things, everything that we need, all of that life-giving power of his presence in his son's hand, his withholding actually accomplishes a third very important purpose. He provokes our pursuit. Okay? We've already seen that we are deficient and he is sufficient. And the next logical step here is that we got to go get it. And this is a critical, critical step of crucial importance to God's plan because actions speak much louder than words. We know that. And we need a very trustworthy way to sincerely say we regret walking away from the relationship, which is what we did back in the garden. We said, no, thanks. I think I know better. And he said, okay, get out of here. No life for you. No more living water. So what could be a better demonstration of our desire for this restoration than pursuing the peace that we previously left. We say, I love it. I do. I want it. I understand it now. I want it. I want it. That's why Peter says of the righteous who are living this way, they must turn from evil and do good. That's how you know you're on the right track. They must seek peace and pursue it actively. Go after it. You got to go get it. So logically for us, that means let us Therefore, make every single effort to do what leads to that peace. And if you want to know how to get there, guess what leads us there? Or rather, who? Because it was Jesus who said, I am the what? Way. I am the way. I am the way and the truth. Because I'm the way to the truth and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father and all of his life-giving presence, right? All of that living water presence of him, except through me, says Jesus. So no wonder he also said, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace on the earth. That's not what I'm doing here. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Because peace is not the reason for coming here. It's just a byproduct of his real reason. Because his real reason for everything is just restoring our relationship. It's the key to everything. Everything just falls in line. Because when we're in that relationship, back in that presence, in that relationship, there's comfort, there's joy, there's peace, there's rest, and there's every single other little part of perfect when you're in that relationship. We're all here because we've all felt it from time to time. A glimmer, a glimpse, pieces here and there. You know what it's like when you're in step with the Lord. It's right. It's, it's the places where you find peace and everything good. Oh, it's so true. So God came here as Jesus to make the way for that relationship. That's it, to make way for that relationship. But he still holds back his peace 
Because an awareness of our adversity increases the desire for our destination, right? If we don't have it, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, we say, right? Like when your wife is away for a little while, you're just like, man, she was great. I can't believe I took her for granted. <laughs> like, I miss her. So These dishes are just, what's happening? Anyway, <laughs> everything falls apart, right? And you just start realizing, oh my goodness, this is hard because I'm missing something, right? And so that, that adversity just drives our desire for our destination, and it's the same reason my wife and I work so hard every single year to make sure every Christmas morning starts off with pain and frustration. We love it. It is our favorite thing. Because every single kid in our family, and this dates back to me. When I was a kid, I woke up the same way. We're just keeping it going. Every kid in our family wakes up to a note card. Okay? Sometimes it's just dangling. Sometimes it's just on their bed in their face. Sometimes they got to perform something to earn it. But one way or another, they wake up to a note card that has a little clue on it that leads each kid to conquer more clues in a very sinister scavenger hunt that takes them all over wherever, you know, our house and outside. They're everywhere from car trunks to toilet tanks before revealing their biggest present of the year. And so why on earth do I keep this up with my kids? Because I am pure evil. And I love it. It amuses me to no end. We get such a kick out of watching them get so frustrated. Sometimes I'm like, look, the bacon's done. Can we just finish? You know, they're also not very bright. But, (laughs) no, they are. They get them eventually. Sometimes we just got to do one of these, like, it's over there. (laughs) Come on, warmer. Anyway. Beyond all that, though, the joy that we get as sick, twisted people, beyond that, it makes them all aware and inspired, and it puts them in the present. Get it? In the present, like in the moment and in the pursuit, they understand they're connected to what they're doing, and that's important because otherwise it is possible to just passively receive gifts without ever being awake enough to appreciate them. You ever have one of these? There's nothing worse. You get so excited, oh, it's Crimpton, I saved, here's this, and they're like, wrong brand, <laughs> you know, and you're like, oh, you're welcome, I love you too. <laughs> but it's, it's one of those things because sometimes also, or, or maybe you get one of these where they're just on their phone so much. You know, what did other people get? What's going on? Let me, who Instagrammed the new thing that they got and whatever. They're like, oh, I got another cool thanks, open, rip, picture, move on. And you're just so disconnected from it that what was the point? Because we can become, I mean, we can be, just sleepwalk through it, passively just receiving these incredible gifts. But this way it connects us. We gotta be awake we got to be awake enough to appreciate. But when we make effort to pursue our prize, right? When we actually have something with connection to it, when we make an effort to pursue our prize, it captures our attention. And it makes us mindful of our motivation. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? It keeps you right there because pursuit forces our focus and it communicates what we appreciate. I know exactly what I'm doing. Oh, this is great. Oh, mom and dad, you got me again. Oh, I love this thing. I'm there. I'm in the present. And that is exactly what our relationship with God needs to be restored. It needs some deliberate decisions to demonstrate devotion. You know, I should be happy to jump through whatever hoops, endure whatever, to take whatever crazy journey path to get to him because I'm so excited for what he wants to give. And yes, guess what? God is going to give us that peace that brings rest, okay? Spoiler alert. I know I'm trying to make you feel like he's not, but he's going to give us that peace. He's going to give us that rest. He wants to. It just has to come after we come to him. So because that is the order of events that has to happen, he holds his peace to teach us to grab hold of him. I want you to say this one with me, all right? He holds his peace to teach us to grab hold of him. He's got it. It's a come and get it, you know, situation. It's right here for the take and come and get it. Because when we're weary and burdened by our life of labor, apart from him, we're naturally driven to the one who holds that perfect peace that we're constantly craving. And when we go actually chase it down, when we get there, when we come to him and we're in his presence, we finally find our rest. It's the only place you're ever going to find it. 
And I know that's an unpopular thing. I look, I understand that there's some real misinformation going around these days, but I want you to hear this loud and clear. Your life is not about feeling good. It is about learning good. Okay, it is not about feeling good. It is about learning good. And learning good doesn't feel great a lot of the time because nothing teaches us to appreciate rest like exhaustion, amen? Mm -hmm. And nothing teaches us to appreciate peace like chaos, amen? Mm -hmm. Because nothing teaches us to appreciate comfort like a little pain, amen? (laughs) But remember this, if you're feeling that, right? If you're feeling that, though God brings grief, because he does, remember? He hurts, he afflicts, he injures. Though God brings grief, he will, this is a promise, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. It always comes with that redemption. For he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to anyone. No, it's his last resort. This is the tough love. He doesn't want to do it, but he wants to save you. He wants to love you. He wants that relationship. And so if he has to do it, he will. So when, let's bring it back around. Here's what's happening in your life this month. When we wonder this month why God won't give the peace that we so desperately want this holiday season, don't hate, appreciate. That's what we got to do. Don't hate, appreciate. Because tough love is still love. And if you're, if you're feeling like God's not giving you the peace that you want, it just means he's reminding you out of love that he has what you lack. And coming to Jesus is how he gives it all back. That's it. It's, it's good news, guys. It's good news. For, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from those who, because here's the stipulation, you know, say, hey, no good thing will he withhold. Well, hold on, from those who, here comes that stipulation, walk uprightly. Oh, he'll give it to those who walk uprightly. Well, what does that mean? Well, where do you walk to? Back to him, of course. Walking uprightly is making a beeline into the arms of Jesus. And if you're walking uprightly to him, you bet he's come and get it, come and get it. It's right here for all the peace and rest that you could ever want. So thank the Lord for holding his peace because it might just be what leads to him holding you. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray, guys. Father God, boy, we sure love you. And we thank you for the tough love that drives us to pursue and ultimately find you. And the Holy Spirit, we ask that you remind us that everything that we lack is just part of the path to make our way back into your loving, peaceful arms. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for enduring the pain of our path to show the way to the only relationship that can ever give us true life. And to that, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Well, thanks for listening in. Why don't you join us on a Sunday morning? If you'd like more information about the church, just point your browser to hisplacechurch.com. Until next time, may the Lord bless you, keep you, and make his face shine upon you.